Flat the Cat for President, based on the creation of Rob Scotton. The ballots had been counted. It was official. Splat was the new student body president. Everyone cheered. Well, almost everyone. It was time for Splat to give his acceptance speech. He was the only one who had run for president, and so he won in a landslide. He cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> As president, I promise that everyone will get new pencils. Each class's goldfish will be served better fish food. And quiet reading time will be quieter, Splat added proudly. At lunch, Splat overheard his classmates grumbling. I just got new pencils. So lame. It was a rough afternoon. Later, Mrs. Wimpy Dimple gave Splat some advice. Take tonight to think about what the kids really want. You can share your new ideas tomorrow, she encouraged him. It didn't take long. Splat came up with his first big idea on the bus. And then at the dinner table, he got even more inspired. Splat spent the rest of the night plotting and planning. The next day, Splat was more than ready. It's a new day and I have new plans, Splat said. From now on, instead of buses, race cars will take us to school, he declared. No more boring food at lunch. Pizza and ice cream will be served today and every day, he vowed. You will each have your very own robot teacher that will do all your homework and take all your tests, he proclaimed. Everyone cheered. Well, almost everyone. At recess, Mrs. Wimpy Dimple and Splat took a walk. She explained that what the school really needed were buses, more food choices at lunchtime, and teachers. You can't make promises that you won't be able to keep, Splat. But you can make a difference, Mrs. Wimpy Dimple said. Look around and see what you can change. And just like that, Splat had a great idea. What if the whole school fixed up the library, he said. And they did. They painted walls and fixed shelves. They sorted books and set up displays. It was a huge success. Hooray for President Splat. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. See you later, alligator. One vote, two votes, I vote, you vote by Bonnie Worth. Illustrated by Aristides Ruiz and Joe Matthew. Voting is something we do every day. It's a way we can choose that gives us our own say. We vote for class president and which snack to get, where to go on class trip, what to pick as class pet. Voting gives each of us our very own voice. 
It allows a large group to make one single choice. How do you vote? With a proudly raised hand, marks on paper, thumbs up or thumbs down, understand? Can you choose not to vote? Yes, but that's a sure way to lose your own voice and to not have a say. The item or person that most of us select will wind up the winner, the one we elect. The biggest of all of America's voting events chooses our president and vice president. Are presidents important? Oh yes, they are, very. They head up the government and the military. Vice presidents take over on the unhappy day when presidents get sick or else pass away. Every four years, we elect them, you see, because we live in a democracy, a government for the people and run by them too, which means that this country is governed by you. Every two years, we elect senators and Congress people of our choice to make laws in Washington and be our state's voice. We also elect sheriffs and mayors and such. Do local elections count? You bet, just as much. When our founders drew up the Constitution, it's true. They said folks should vote, but they did not say who. Since then, our history is marked by brave fights waged by people who struggled to win voting rights for all of the races and for all womankind, and also for 18-year-olds, bear in mind. That means that quite soon, you will get to vote too. So please pay attention. This matters to you. Voting Rights Timeline, 1870, 15th Amendment, Black Men Can Vote. 1920, 19th Amendment, Women Can Vote. 1924, Citizenship Act, Native Americans Can Vote. 1971, 26th Amendment, 18-year-olds can vote. Only citizens can vote and, as you've just been told, people who are at least 18 years old, you must sign up in person or on the internet with name, address, and birth date, and one more thing yet. You can write down your party if you do not mind. Cakes and ice cream, you're thinking, is the party that kind? This kind of party, I'm here to report, is the kind that we know as the political sort. It's made up of large groups of citizens who share beliefs and ideas and opinions too. Democrats and Republicans are the biggest too, plus small parties to pick from, more than just a few. In primary elections, run before November, votes will be cast by each party member for the candidate who they hope and they pray will be on the ballot come election day. Candidates set out on the campaign trail to convince voters that they will not fail. A vote for me, the candidates say, will make your dreams come true someday. With speeches and ads and town hall meetings, with handshakes and waves and cheery greetings, they work to win the voters' trust, to win nomination, this is a must. I may be wrong, but it does seem to me that voting is one big responsibility. As a voter, you must follow news carefully. You should read, watch, and listen, and then try to see what the candidates, if elected, plan to do. What are their beliefs? Do they ring true for you? Debates are held for the people to see. The candidates talk on live TV. Moderators on hand have questions to ask. 
To give their best answer is the candidate's task. A debate is an argument that's meant to sway. It is run by rules in a most formal way. At meetings called rallies, supporters get out to cheer the candidate they care most about. Supporters on the phone or going door to door say, vote for my party on election day. They raise lots of money, collect change in jars, and sell campaign stickers to stick on cars. George Washington won the vote, so I have been told, during a winter that was snowy and cold. In 1845, Congress passed a vote to say there would be an earlier election day, November. The day each year is easy to remember. It's the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. This date was chosen for a very good reason. It came at the end of the harvesting season. When election day comes, the voters' big role is to make sure to vote at their assigned poll. A poll is where you vote. As a general rule, it is a public place, like a firehouse or school. If you're out of town, there's a chance that you might mail an absentee ballot. Voting is your right. People cast their votes by different means. Ballots fed into computers or direct voting machines. However you vote, it's important you see that voters are given complete privacy. A curtain or screen protects voters from view. This ensures that your vote is known only to you. The polls close up at the end of the day. Here come the counters. Please clear the way. By special computer, poll results are scanned, but some votes are still counted out by hand. The results are sent to the Board of Elections, which declares the winner after careful inspections. The loser admits their bitter defeat. The winner announces their victory sweet. The winner vows to serve everyone in the land, not just the supporters who lent them a hand. If all of this rings true, it is my dearest hope that you will cast your first vote for the cat in the hat. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. See you later, alligator. Grace for President, written by Kelly DiPuccio, pictures by Luyan Pham. One Monday morning in September, Mrs. Barrington rolled out a big poster with all of the president's pictures on it. Grace Campbell could not believe her eyes. Where are the girls? That is a very good question, said Mrs. Barrington. The truth is, our country has never had a woman president. No girl president? Ever? Grace asked. No, I'm afraid not, said Mrs. Barrington. Grace sat at her desk and stewed. No girls? Who'd ever heard of such a crazy thing? Finally, she raised her hand. Yes, Grace? I've been thinking it over, and I'd like to be president. 
Several students in the class laughed. Well, I think that's a star-spangled idea, Grace, said Mrs. Barrington. In fact, we can have our own election right here at Woodrow Wilson Elementary. The snickering in the room stopped. Grace smiled. Would anyone else like to run for president? Mrs. Barrington asked the class. Nobody raised their hand. Becoming president was going to be easy, Grace thought. The next day, Mrs. Barrington made an announcement. In the name of democracy, I have invited Mr. Waller's class to join our election. Their class has nominated Thomas Cobb to be their presidential candidate. Grace's heart sank. Thomas was the school spelling bee champion. His experiments always took a blue ribbon at the science fair, and he was the captain of the soccer team. Becoming president wasn't going to be so easy after all, Grace thought. The teachers put the names of all 50 states and the District of Columbia into a hat. Everyone except for Grace and Thomas got to choose a state. I'm Texas, said Anthony. I'm New Hampshire, said Rose. I'm Michigan, said Robbie. What does the number 16 mean? Each state is assigned a number of electoral votes. That number is determined by how many people live in that state, said Mrs. Barrington. Each of you will be a representative for your state. Altogether, our country has 538 electoral votes, Mr. Waller explained. On election day, the candidate who receives 270 electoral votes or more wins the election. Why 270? asked Rose. That's more than half of all the electoral votes, Mr. Waller said. Becoming president really wasn't going to be so easy, Grace thought. Grace came up with a campaign slogan, Make History, Vote Grace Campbell for President. Thomas came up with his own campaign slogan, Vote for Thomas Cobb, the best man for the job. Grace listened to what issues were important to the students, and she made a list of campaign promises. A peaceful school, no bullies. A cleaner school, no littering. Better hot lunches, no more fish stick tacos. Thomas made up his own list of promises. Free tutoring, free soccer lessons, fish stick tacos every week. Grace made campaign posters and buttons. Thomas made posters and buttons too. Each week, the teachers set aside time for the candidates to meet with their constituents. Polls were taken. Voters were making their choices. Grace continued to campaign. At recess, she gave speeches. During lunch, she handed out free cupcakes. After school, she held rallies. Meanwhile, Thomas wasn't worried. He had cleverly calculated that the boys held slightly more electoral votes than the girls. At recess, Thomas studied his spelling words. During lunch, he worked on his latest science experiment. After school, he played soccer. Even before the election, Grace made good on her promises. She joined the safety squad, she organized a school beautification committee, and she volunteered her time in the school cafeteria. 
In early November, Woodrow Wilson Elementary hosted a special election day assembly. Grace and Thomas took their places on stage as the school band began to play. Henry was the first representative to approach the microphone. The Yellow Hammer State of Alabama casts its nine electoral votes for Thomas Cobb. Fletcher said, the last frontier state of Alaska casts its three electoral votes for the best man for the job, Thomas Cobb. Hannah called out, the Grand Canyon state of Arizona casts its 11 electoral votes for Grace Campbell. And so it went. State after state after state cast their electoral votes. The scoreboard in the gymnasium kept track of the totals. The voting demonstration was quickly coming to an end. Clara approached the podium. The Badger State of Wisconsin casts its 10 votes for my best friend, Grace Campbell. Grace looked at the scoreboard. Thomas had 268 electoral votes. She had 267. There was only one state still unaccounted for, Wyoming. Thomas grinned. Grace felt sick. Sam walked up to the microphone. He looked at Thomas. He looked at Grace. He looked down at Grace's handmade flag. Sam didn't say a word. What are you waiting for? Thomas whispered. The band stopped playing. All eyes were on Wyoming. Finally, Sam cleared his throat. <clears> throat> The Equality State of Wyoming casts its three electoral votes for Grace Campbell. The gymnasium erupted in loud cheers and a few boos. Mrs. Barrington approached the podium. With 270 electoral votes, the winner is Grace Campbell. Thomas looked stunned. Grace hugged Sam. Why did you do it? She asked. Sam handed Grace his flag. Because, he said, I thought you were the best person for the job. The following week, students in Mrs. Barrington's class were preparing for their career day presentations. Grace volunteered to go first. She stood at the front of the room and glanced at the poster still hanging on the wall. My name is Grace Campbell, and when I grow up, I'm going to be President of the United States. This time, Everyone believed that she would. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. See you later, alligator. I Ran for President by Katherine Steer, illustrated by Lynn Avril. It would be great to run for President of the United States. If I ran for President, I'd hope the people of the United States would choose me for a very important job, the job of leading our country and I'd hope to follow in the footsteps of past presidents such as George Washington, our first president, Thomas Jefferson, 
Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. I'd have to think carefully about my decision to run for president. I would want to know how my family felt about it too. Then I'd ask myself, am I the best person for the job? Am I ready to work very, very, very hard for my country? Do lots of people believe in me? And will they help me run for office? If I could answer yes to all those questions, then I'd declare my candidacy. That means I'd announce I was interested in the job of President of the United States. If I ran for president, I'd run a campaign to let voters learn all about me. People who thought I would be a good president would donate money or time to help. I'd hire people to work on my campaign too. Campaigns can make a candidate famous. Soon my name or face would appear on signs, buttons, bumper stickers, and t-shirts. I'd even star in television commercials. If I ran for president, I'd work with my political party. That's a group of people who share the same beliefs about how the country should be governed. They support candidates who uphold those ideas. The two major parties are the Democratic Party, their symbol is a donkey, and the Republican Party, their symbol is an elephant. There are other parties too, called third parties. But people besides me would want to be president. The Republican and Democratic parties must choose whom they'll support in the election. In some states, like Iowa, the parties each hold meetings called caucuses, where members pick their favorite candidate. In most states, party members hold an election called a primary. Caucuses and primaries show which candidates are popular with voters and who might have the best chance of being elected president. The first primary is held in New Hampshire in the winter before the presidential election. I'd be sure to visit there, but I'd have to bundle up. In the summer before the election, the political parties announce their candidate for president. The major parties make this announcement at meetings called conventions. Each state sends delegates to the convention. Delegates vote for the candidate who was most popular in their state. A convention looks like a big celebration full of cheering and chanting, balloons and confetti. Millions of Americans watch the excitement on TV. By the time of the convention, everyone usually knows which candidate will be chosen, but the delegates still hold a vote. If my party chooses me to run for president, I'd make a speech to get everyone excited about helping me win. I'd tell the American people about my platform, my plans and ideas for our country. My running mate would make a speech too. That's the person who'd be my vice president if I became president. If I ran for president, I'd be invited to debate with other presidential candidates. A person called a moderator would ask us questions. People across the country would listen carefully to our answers. Reporters would ask me questions too about my life, my family, even my kitten Sassy. They'd print old photographs of me in newspapers and magazines, like the snapshot of me in my superhero costume or my baby picture when I still wore diapers. If I ran for president, I would travel the country to meet lots of people. I'd have my own campaign bus or airplane to take me from place to place. Inside, there'd be comfy seats, perfect for checking out the news, writing speeches, 
and thinking about how to solve the nation's problems. I'd take naps too. I'd need the extra rest. Finally, in November, election day would arrive. If I ran for president, I'd be nervous and excited. On election day, millions of voters from across the country go to their polling places to cast their ballots. That's another way to say that they vote. In our country, people vote in private. No one but you knows how you voted, but I know I'd choose my favorite candidate, me. Once the voting is finished, officials count up the ballots. Then comes the announcement on the television, radio, in the newspapers, and on the internet. People everywhere find out who will be the next president of the United States. I'd stay up late and keep my fingers crossed. On January 20th, I'd say the words of the oath of office and be sworn in as president. On that day, my inauguration day, there'd be a parade and a fancy ball. Then I'd move into the White House in Washington, D.C. to begin my four-year term as the President of the United States of America. And what would I do when I became President? Well, that's another story. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. See you later, alligator. Robin Hill School, Election Day, written by Margaret McNamara, illustrated by Mike Gordon. There was a knock on Mrs. Connor's classroom door. That is our new student, said Mrs. Connor. This is Becky, said Mrs. Connor. Hello, Becky. The class said loudly. Hello, Becky said quietly. Nia showed Becky where to sit. Can anyone tell Becky what day it is today? Asked Mrs. Connor. Today is Tuesday, said Ayana. Today is election day, she said. Yes, said Mrs. Connor. Today we will vote for our class president. After lunch, the children gave speeches. I promise to get us a candy machine, said Nick. Hooray, said the class. I promise no homework, said Emma. Hooray, hooray, said the class. I promise summer vacation will last for six months, said Nia. Hooray, 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 said the class. Would anyone else like to give a speech, asked Mrs. Connor. Becky thought she could be a good class president. But she was new. She did not have any friends. She did not have a speech. Anyone? Asked Mrs. Connor. She was looking right at Becky. Becky took a deep breath. She got up from her chair. I cannot promise candy machines or less homework. Or more vacation, she said. I can only promise to do my best. Becky sat down. 
No one said a word, especially not Hooray. Now, said Mrs. Connor, it is time to vote. The children put their heads on their desks and their hands in the air. Mrs. Connor counted all the votes. Becky is the winner, she said. The new class president was happy. You made a good promise, Hannah said. It is a promise I will keep, said Becky. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. See you later, alligator.